So welcome to you all. I would like to take time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And I'd also like to acknowledge that you're joining us today from many places near and far, and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Thank you for joining us for this presentation today. It is our seventh meeting of the Peter Wall Institute Advanced Studies Catalyst Program on the Climate and Nature Emergency. But it is the first time that we are privileged to have four presenters to demonstrate the value of transdisciplinary research on a specific, specific aspect of this emergency. Let me just remind you of some housekeeping notes. Each presenter will give their presentation, which will be followed by a Q&A session. People in the audience in person can raise their hand during the Q&A if they have a question, but please wait until you have received the microphone before asking a question. The audience on Zoom will not be able to hear you without a mic. People on Zoom, please put your questions in the Q&A box. The questions will be asked on your behalf during the Q&A portion of the presentations. So we have with us four persons working transdisciplinary, which is the largest number of such people that we have met in the course of the last nine months. But it's of interest because it's exactly the kind of work that our cohort is aiming to achieve. And the nine individuals who are involved are from different backgrounds and finding it interesting to learn what they have themselves not learned in their own disciplines. And so I think this is the reason I want to just take a, a small moment of your time before we hear the, the guts of this afternoon's presentation. In this session, there will be presentations on the political economy of biodiversity loss. And this, like the whole question that we're trying to address, the emergency of the climate and nature emergency, is hugely complex. It's only after, what, 50 years? No, even more, at UBC, the, the seriousness of this question has become so apparent. Those, those of us like myself, who were appointed in the prehistoric era in order to teach something called environmental chain, have had transformations in our own intellectual lives that are dramatic, and we are certainly not the same people as we were at that time. But this simply to say that the nine of us who've been chatting together and recently delivered a, an incendiary letter to the planning team of the UBC 2050 vision, have, the, have ourselves learned from each other, even at our grand old ages, because of the inherent complexity of the dilemma that we, we face. So I'd like to thank all the presenters who are from all different backgrounds, all different stages in their careers, and it's a privilege for us to hear from each other. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, thank you, Olaf. That was that was lovely, and we all. I, I myself actually owe Olaf a lot of gratitude for for leading the way. In geography, Olaf was, uh, is a professor in geography, and that's where I'm also situated here at UBC. I'm an associate professor in geography, and uh, I study the political economy of biodiversity loss. 
Uh, I'll also say, and maybe this will come up in the Q&A after, but I'm also very involved with the Center for Climate Justice at UBC, um, working with a whole bunch of faculty from across UBC to, to make um, more transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, action-oriented um, research and political advocacy as well uh, happen. So I'm happy to talk about that. So today we're gonna go really more from land to sea, I think. Um, so my overarching interest is in understanding what I and my collaborator call the extinction paradox, um, represented by this graph. The line in green symbolizes states, so governments all over the world becoming more green, becoming kind of environmental states. So that shows um, endangered species laws in green over time. And cumulative, sorry, those are cumulative domestic laws to protect wildlife worldwide. And the red line is the Living Planet Index, um, which is a measure of wild animal abundance, which shows a decline of around 60% on average for wild vertebrates since 1970. And so like, many others. The question is really how can so much activity, you know, laws, policies, science, um, advocacy um, achieve so little in terms of concrete gains for nature? This is a huge question, right? Um, and it's a question that demands a lot of um, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary thinking. I've been thinking of it most concretely in terms of this species shown here, which is caribou, this is boreal caribou, um, on a pipeline in, in northeast BC. And caribou are, are a species that are have the highest protections under Canadian endangered species law. They're treaty protected as well, so they're a species of great importance to Treaty 8 nations. Um, and they are on a basically a, a, a course to extinction as well. And so my research group has been really thinking about like, well, how is this possible, right? Like what are the political and economic conditions that really authorize such a disposability of a species that's supposed to be so award, um, um, protected? So that's really my research program. But today I'm gonna more just give a quick overview. So this question this, uh, related to subsidies, don't worry, I'm getting there. Um, so again, this question, like, how do we, why this extinction paradox, right? Why so much, um, how can like so many activities, laws, policies, science also be, um, take place at the same time as this decline? And one answer to it is really capital flows, right? Like, where does capital flow to? Um, there is just massive amounts of flows of capital that flow to biodiversity degraded activities. So this really shows this, the, the largest graph here is, is an estimate of harmful investment. So those are private flows of capital going to things like um, agribiz, you know, oil and gas developments. Um, uh, and then, uh, um, and so I would also say that this is likely understated, right? These are some, some estimates. And then the other, um, Bar graph here that you see is harmful subsidies, right? And so this is these are state-supported flows of capital that really like incentivize biodiversity harmful activities. And this is estimated here from an OECD report at 500 billion per year. Canada, world. That's worldwide. Worldwide harmful subsidies. Yeah. Um. Again, just to say those are likely understatements. And then I've posed these against. Um, financial flows that are actually meant to sort of do something positive about biodiversity um, conservation or sustainable use. So you see po positive um, public positive finance pictured here and then private positive finance. So you just see this disjuncture. It's one of the like ways we can understand this extinction paradox is just to say that there's like capital flowing in the wrong directions to the wrong activities. Um, I mentioned that those graphs were likely to be underestimates. This, these ones here, especially in here, I'm just going to talk about the subsidies. So that's 500 billion OECD subsidies. It's largely agriculture. But this was another report that was done a couple of years ago now that was a bit more expansive of thinking about subsidies, and it found annually $1.8 trillion per year. This is equivalent to 2% of global GDP. Um, and this is also an underestimate. It doesn't include mining. 
And then just for example, mining subsidies are actually massive and they're increasing right now because of the energy trend, the sort of demand for critical minerals and states kind of jockeying against each other to try to get more investment. Um, and in Australia, just for example, subsidies per annum for mining are, are estimated to be about six to eight billion dollars per year. So again, these are underestimates of the amount that governments actually incentivize uh, biodiversity degrading activities. Okay, so lots of estimates. The primary take home is that these subsidies are significant and this helps us understand this extinction paradox um, in that amidst all this flurry of environmental activity is this kind of state-sponsored incentivization of the very se sectors that cause harm. Um, I just had one. Oh yeah, so um, this is another, so I'm gonna make three points and then I'll conclude. So um, this is showing here research that shows agricultural and biofuel subsidies across five countries, Brazil, Chile, China, Indonesia, Mexico, which adds up to about 206 billion annually. And the study authors compared this to the funds flowing to stop deforestation, mainly through this red or reducing emissions from uh, deforestation and forest degradation finance. Um, and again, that study shows those funds only amounting to about 1.3 billion. So really, again, just showing that these, the amount of capital flowing to like do something about biodiversity loss is really just these like little tiny minnows sw swimming up this like Niagara Falls of capital that is financing biodiversity loss. I think the point I wanna make here about this is that this story of domestic subsidization really complicates the way we understand environmental problems and what drives them. Um, often we hear a story that these problems are driven by growth and consumption, which is undoubtedly true. But what I think that the story of subsidies reminds us is that actually our governments are actively involved in um, and, and the state policy, how important it is to actually um, underpinning that kind of like overconsumption and growth in a particular direction. And so I think this first point I wanna make is that subsidies remind us that the state is a contradictory institution that we look to to both protect the environment, but it's also one that focuses much of its formidable power to really stoke economic development of a particular kind ceaselessly, um, even by using its own capital to make resource extraction activities more lucrative for companies or producers than they would have been without it. So that's my first point, just this reminder that when we think about what's causing environmental problems, we might look to consumption or population growth or something like that, but that we, we need to really be focused also on the role that the state plays. My second point I wanna make is that this is not a new problem. Um, the Biodiversity Convention, the, con um, the Convention on Biological Diversity, it has taken up and it, it says um, it's aware of this problem. In 2010, in Nagoya, 193 governments agreed to actually identify, eliminate, and reform these subsidies. This was Aichi Target 3, um, yet it failed miserably. Um, and so this really is my second point, which is that um, recognition is not of these subsidies is not new. There's this decade of failure, right? So there's lots of talk, little change, and this helps us think about this extinction paradox as well. And then of course, it makes us reflect on why these subsidies stay in place and what is needed to break the log jam, this kind of, um, uh, to sort of arrest this flow of capital. And this leads to the transdisciplinary uh, collaboration, at least in some shape or form, is that we started, we thought through this problem together, myself, Rashid, and a forestry prof, um, Tara Martin, and we published this um, piece in Conservation Letter where we started to like explain like not only simply describing that this problem is hard to solve, but also starting to think through like why it has been so hard to stop these flow of subsidies. And one thing that we, uh, found is that these subsidies are very hard to identify and track. The data circulating is often aggregate, which, make, which makes it very challenging for those who want to change these subsidies as that work has to be like national and subnational. So there's a real need for more government disclosure and transparency about these subsidies. And this is a point 
that we made in this intervention um, where we called for really subsidy accountability, right? That we actually need governments to be much more transparent about these flows of capital and to name them so that people can get, a, get to the work of building political power to change them. And then this leads to my second point around why, why the failures is that these subsidies are deeply political. There's growing evidence across sectors that these subsidies tend to prefer large producers and um, more wealthy uh, elites. Um, in a recent report about subsidies, the authors pointed to the lobbying efforts of companies in the US as key barriers to reform. They use this chart that really breaks down lobbying spending by sector. sector. The green is, is the business lobby. So again, here, this is just pointing that, you know, subsidies don't benefit everyone the same way in a particular jurisdiction or a country. And um, there's a lot more work and research work needed to really sketch out who benefits from these subsidies in the that harm biodiversity. And here I think Rashid's lab's work is so important because it's really showing how these subsidies are spatialized and the beneficiaries and, and losers, losers of them. And so this is what I think um, Rashid's been doing and I think we need more of um, and including uh, uh, Audrey's going to talk a bit about the research we've been doing in, in Northern BC too around this issue, but we really need this kind of environmental justice approach to thinking about subsidies, both to identify these different beneficiaries um, and who's harmed by these, um, but also in order to like do the work of, of trying to change them. So in that vein, I'm going to pass it to Audrey, who's been, who's done some really cool research um, on subsidies related to uh, caribou decline. So, Audrey. Let's see if I can stick the tech landing here. So the Zoom people can see it. Yeah. If I, maybe I'll just do this. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, it's great to be here. And let me move this out of the way easily. Okay, so I'm going to be uh, presenting this story map um, on a study that myself and two graduate students did under Jess's um, uh, this leadership. And <laughs> I want to shout out in particular Adriana Di Silvestro, who is the mapping genius behind this study. Um, and this is the story map where we released the results kind of um, to share publicly. So I'm going to be scrolling a lot, but you can find this online. Uh, and kind of jumping in where Jess left off, um, we started from this question of uh, how can the state be simultaneously passing all these laws to protect caribou uh, while supporting all the activities that are known to harm caribou and lead to their extinction and extirpation in BC. Um, and as Jess mentioned, obviously there's a lot more to the story with caribou in terms of their cultural significance and their political and legal importance to Treaty Eight Nations in particular. Um, I'm not gonna be speaking to that too much, but a lot of this research is aligned with some of the recent court cases around cumulative effects um, that have been uh, at least in 2021, which is when the study was published, we're really kind of at the fore in this conversation. Um, but I, I just wanted to talk about the reason that we thought this study would be useful to share is because it was an attempt to try to link these like abstract financial flows or kind of numbers on government budgets with some kind of material impact on the ground. Um, so I'm going to walk through how we did that, which was to start with the science that's already been done. There's fantastic science around caribou because as just mentioned they're so studied so charismatic and so what we know about that is that this industrial disturbance is what is causing caribou declines so that's from forestry and from mining but also from oil and gas which was the focus of this study and they do this in a lot of ways through pollution and noise and just habitat loss in general but the main way is through these linear features from access roads to oil and gas wells and then also from seismic lines for oil and gas exploration. Um, and so we, we kind of had that science established. And so what we decided to do 
was to start with the critical habitat boundaries that the federal government set under SARA. So you can see here, these are the um, these are the habitat boundaries for critical caribou habitat. This is habitat that is essential to caribou survival according to the government of Canada. This isn't all of their habitat. This is just a small portion that has kind of been mandated by the government that this should not be disturbed to the point that caribou can't fulfill these functions. Um, and so the next thing that we decided to do was to get um, government data on all of the active oil well, oil and gas wells in British Columbia and to map that on top of this, which looks like this. And what's cool about this format, if you'll indulge me for a second, is that uh, you can actually really zoom in and see what the, wow, what all these little dots, this is a little different than at home, what all these little dots mean in terms of the impacts on the landscape. Um, so you can see, see if I can do this better with the mouse. Okay, well, you can look this up and see at home, but you can, you can zoom in um, and you can look at all of the different, uh, both these active oil and gas wells, which really only capture a part of the picture here, because there are um, also all of these seismic lines and there are uh, oil and gas wells that have already been retired or even have technically been restored. And you can still really see the footprint of that on the landscape. You don't need to be an ecologist or a conservation scientist to be able to see what a massive footprint this has. Um, and so the next thing that we did is that we submitted a Freedom of Information Act request from to the BC government to ask for information about their three largest subsidy programs. Um, and then we were able to get a list of all of the uh, companies that received these subsidies from 2018 to 2021. Um, and because oil and gas wells are not, uh, this, this information isn't well specific, um, which doesn't matter in the end anyway, because ultimately what these subsidies do is they're lowering the operating costs for, uh, for all of these companies, which just makes it easier for, in the terms of the BC government, for them to expand beyond what would otherwise occur. So to do more of this exploration and development than they would have otherwise, and also makes it easier for other forms of private investment to flood into this sector, expanding its footprint. And uh, in terms of our results, basically what we found is that there were over 3,000 wells that active wells that were in the boundaries of critical caribou habitat. And of those wells, 54% or over half were given some type of public assistance by the provincial government in the last, well, at the time, the last three years, 2018 to 2021. Um, and so there's kind of more to this story in terms of uh, who's benefiting and what the impacts of this are and kind of the contradictions of British Columbia's there should be a cute picture of caribou running through the snow right here, but alas. Um, but what we, but the, the big point that I just wanted to make today uh, was thinking about, yeah, how we try to link these indirect drivers. With indirect drivers, you're not really going to be able to have a one to one, like this dollar creates this impact. But this was a way, and spatializing for us was a useful tool to try to make some of these links more concrete in an attempt to, as Jess said, try to build a little bit more of the awareness and political power to question why the government is kind of funding these contradictory, contradictory aims. Yeah, leave it there. Yeah. Can I help the next person get there? <laughs> Thank 
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, Jessica and Audrey, for showing us about the impact of subsidies in the terrestrial ecosystem. And now I'm going to bring us to the ocean. So um, this is a study that um, Rashid and I have been working on. Um, we are looking at poverty line income and fishery subsidies in developing countries. And yeah, if you want to know more about this picture, it's um, a group, uh, it's an ethnic group of fishers in Sabah, uh, Malaysia, which is where I did my field work and they basically live on boats. Um, there are very few of them left, but they do travel around the Sabah area and this, I think their lifestyle underlines um, what this paper was looking at. So um, you know, this is a collaboration between uh, Rashid and I and a couple of other co-authors. And oh, just <laughs> let me introduce myself. My name is Louise. Um, I'm a research associate at the um, Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries. And my work is mainly um, concerned with socioeconomic analysis of issues related to fishery sustainability. And so um, this, so, um, this really uh, drives the, uh, motivates what this paper was about, um, which was to think about how can we reconcile two persistent challenges in fisheries, which is um, poverty among fishing communities, and also the provision of harmful fishing subsidies to um, the to national fishing fleets. So um, one potential solution that we were thinking about um, was to think about how can, what about if we use harmful subsidies that a country provides and we direct that towards poverty alleviation as, uh, instead. So that would help to address uh, poverty among fishing communities, which is one of, which is a very common narrative um, among um, coastal fishing communities, especially in developing countries. And um, Rashid will speak more about the harmful fishery subsidies, but um, this led us to um, think about a hypothetical question, which is um, to what extent can harmful fishery subsidies provided by a country finance the cost of lifting fishers out of poverty? So to do this, um, we did a quite a straightforward exercise. We estimated fishers' income in 30 of um, the world's coastal least developed countries, which is where fishers would feel the impact of um, over depleted fish stocks the most in terms of their livelihoods and food security and general um, well being. So uh, we compared the income um, to two measures of poverty line income. Um, the first one was the World Bank's um, international poverty line income of US, um, so one, 190 US dollars per person per day. And this is also the extreme poverty line income. Um, and the second one was the uh, minimum living wage uh, provided by uh, in different countries. So once we had that, uh, we calculated the gap, which is so basically just the difference between the poverty line income and the um, fishing income and what it would cost to cover this poverty gap for countries where the fishing income fell below the poverty line. Uh, once we had that, we uh, evaluated whether the harmful fisheries subsidies provided by each country would be sufficient to cover this poverty gap. I'm going to quickly go through our main findings. Um, in terms of the 190 poverty line um, income, we found that none of the countries, uh, the average fishing income in, uh, was always below this um, international poverty line. And this graph shows the gap um, among the 30 uh, least developed countries. So um, yeah, you can see that average daily fishing income was only 64 cents per person per day. And so this would give an average gap of 126 um, per person per day. Um, 
And if we move on to the next property line um, measure, which was the minimum living wage in each country, uh, we saw that this graph shows, um, because the minimum living wage uh, measure is different for each country, this graph shows how much it would take for each country, uh, the, the fishing income in each country to reach that um, poverty line. And um, for this measure, three countries, um, the fishing income in three countries uh, was exceeded the minimum living wage, and that's where you see the negative bars. But by and large, um, we also found that fishing income did not reach this minimum living wage um, poverty line income. And then moving on to whether the harmful fisheries subsidies will be sufficient for covering the um, poverty gap. Um, first of all, we estimated that the total cost for covering the um, 190 poverty line income gap would be uh, around $2.65 billion um, per year. And this was uh, fairly similar to the, uh, the minimum living wage gap, which was slightly lower at 2.2 um, billion US dollars per year. But what is interesting is that the number of countries uh, ranged between two, 11 to 13 countries had sufficient harmful subsidies to cover this gap. And this would translate to approximately like 400 to over 700,000 fishers who could be brought out of poverty if the um, harmful fishery subsidies were redirected to cover um, the poverty gap instead. So uh, the main message of this study was that um, overall, we find that fishing income is really insufficient for fishers to make a living um, in the least developed countries, which is where the need for fisheries resources to support livelihoods and food security is the most urgent. And um, in so 11 to 13, which is like 37 to 43% of the assessed countries, redirecting the harmful fisheries subsidies could really help to alleviate poverty. And this just goes to show that diverting harmful fisheries subsidies, which have such a negative impact on society and on biodiversity, can really help to achieve both biodiversity and societal goals. That's, yeah. Just end of my who will speak more about companies. Yeah. yeah, so so Luis has given a very concrete example of the kind of work we do. And uh, group, I mean the Fisheries Economic Research Unit and the uh, Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries, but also at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs because I'm jointly appointed there. So whilst we wait for this, Louis, you know, an idea came. We have another paper. Huh? <laughs> because as you were talking and I'm seeing the numbers, I think this is a partial analysis of what removing, redirecting the subsidies will do. You just calculated the money. But when you take out the subsidies, you reduce the pressure on the fish stock. And they are going to be more fish, mm -hmm. therefore more catch, right? Mm -hmm. Which is an additional benefit of doing mm -hmm. that. We got to calculate that, and we can do it. Yeah, yes, mm -hmm. that's wonderful. Just listening to you, you did a good job. That's nice. So, so this is uh, I'm going to connect all that we've had are uh, connected to a number of these subsidies, as we have been talking about sustainable de development goals of the UN. There are 17 of them: reducing poverty, hunger. Uh, gender equality, of course, the ocean. So there's 17 of them. And all that we've talked about, you and Louise, connects to all of this. And then I'll bring in the WTO, World Trade Organization, because the world gave them gave them the mandate to actually deal with this. And so there's some results. Now, what do I do? Let me start. For, for you to understand what I mean, and my group and colleagues, actually, because like, we, we do a lot of in the disciplinary work is just consider our relationship with the ocean. And this is with biodiversity, with nature, but the ocean is where we, we look at. So if you look at our relationship, you boil that down to the very basic. What do we do? We, the people, when we go to the ocean, we do two things. We take, 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 take what we need, what we want, what we desire into our economic, social, cultural systems, right? We do what we do with them. I'm 
I'm not going to tell you what. <laughs> we do what we do with them. And what do we produce at the end? Waste. And where do the waste go to? They go to the environment, to the ocean. So good things come from the ocean, bad things go to the ocean. And if we don't do this wisely, we're going to destroy biodiversity and the ocean. This is what all our work is about. And that's why all our interdisciplinarity is very important. We have to understand how to take the nature, you know, the science. We have to understand the economic, the culture, the people, anthropology. We need lawyers. We need psychologists, philosophers, right? And we need the green chemistry and so on. So this is really an interdisciplinary work. And when I talk to a group full of economists, which I am, I call myself an interdisciplinary oceans and fisheries economist. I tell them not even economies alone can solve this problem. And they think I'm crazy. No, you can't. You have to work with everybody. So that is the basic structure we try to work with colleagues to try to ensure we don't overtake, we don't overpollute. Okay. So back to subsidies. I'm showing you this figure because an economist can't get away from figures and equations and so on. I'm not expecting you to absorb anything here. The main point is that. Things in famous God and Schaefer bioeconomic model that brings ecology and economics together. So just see this as the money you make from catching a certain type of fish, salmon, and this is the cost to you of catching the fish. And I think you alluded to that just in your opening. Without subsidies, if we let us do what we want to do, we usually overdo this. We fish a lot until there's no money to be made, right? Or there's no benefit to be made. That is without any subsidy. But when you pay part of the cost of fishing, for example, like fuel subsidies, you take down the cost down like this, which means now instead of stopping at E3 with your fishing effort, you go all the way to that. This extra power goes in to catch the poor fish that cannot fight back, you know, <laughs> right? So, it's your own tax, tax money to do this. And so this is the basic economic, bioeconomic model. That's why I talk a lot about this. And we see it in real life. When fuel prices were going on, there was a demonstration in Europe. They took that fish to the minister's office, put it on her door sheet. The next day, they approve subsidies in Malaysia, the same. And then they go fishing. They pay half of the fuel deal. And then, so that is, that is the underlying. At UBC, we've been working a lot places which the world actually uses and relies on. But WTMM, this is where they come. They come to look for data. I'm building and revising and improving this. And given the time, I'll just show you a few. Two, two, two. This is a summary of the latest data we will put together. Fishery subsidies around the world. And essentially, the ways you talked about harmful subsidies or capacity enhancing subsidies. These are subsidies that push the industry to fish more than they would in the market system. Like you, or if you buy inches, or you pay, Canada used to do a lot of this, uh, what we call unemployment insurance, special one for the fish, for good reason. And what does it do? It keeps them on the water for too long. <laughs> so that's harmful subsidies. And we have the good subsidies. You know, like everything, it's not all bad. You can use public funds actually to support biodiversity instead of taking that. And anything you do like that, we call it good subsidy. And there are subsidies that are not easy to put in a box. This is the one we worry about. You see how large it is. And I, I don't know time. You know, uh, there's a reason why you see two graphs here. So this is ambiguous, beneficial, and bad subsidies. And then we have them for developed countries and then low income and high income countries. There's a whole story behind this. When we started doing this work, I, I said, China, when it comes to fishes, how can anyone convince me that China is a developing country? <laughs> it's the largest fishing country. It has a trillion dollars with it. It can do virtually anything on the ocean. So I pulled China out of the developed box and put them in, in, out of the developing to the development. Publish the paper, you know, China, China, China went up to me. They actually went up and said, we should have paid you for this. You know? Because in the UN, China is a developing country. And they 
God, I guess this is like crazy because so then you know what I do? Now I do high income and China jumps into here. So this big difference you see is just because China is no more classified developing and it's put there that suddenly because China is so large. That's the, the little story. But the main picture is most of the subsidies we need, about 65 percent, 22 billion out of the total of 35 billion is actually lots of your tax money. Remember, the fishing sector is about 100 million tons of fish, which may be about 150 billion a year, and you have 35 billion free money coming in. Can you imagine that? If you had a business and somebody was doing that to you, you would be smiling to the bank, right? You see, and, and then I mean, the, the position. The second picture is about who gets this money. This is powerful. I'm a sugar was my PA just there. She's not a postdoc. They have do this. She got to say thesis, actually. What we did was, I got challenged by the Speaker of the House of Indonesia. She said, who oh, gives us the same why? So because we want to help small scale fishers, we want to help our coastal community. At the time, I knew this is not what is happening, but I didn't have data. And then Anna came to the PhD and said, Let's look at it. This is what you see 20, 16 percent. That's the only, after the total 35, only 16 percent we found that goes to small scale coastal communities, indigenous communities. Over 80 percent goes to the large scale industry. Right. And this has so many consequences. So I'll, I'll soon finish. So many consequences. It reduces fish biomass, obviously. You overfish the biodiversity goes down, the system has, and the food security of millions of people. I told you 100 million tons of fish. If you convert that to the number of mature cows, how many will they be? Anybody knows? Louis, you can't talk. <laughs> That is, if you assume a mature cow is a ton in weight, which is a reasonable assumption, that will be over 100 million mature fish cows that will pull out of the ocean each year. Just think about that massive biomass. What happens to the ecosystem? Uh, but that's a lot of food in West Africa and Bangladesh. People will not have animal protein in their food from it. And it's jobs, right? Then, then, then you have the small scale, large scale dynamics, which I talked about. Developed country, developing. Most of these subsidies are in the rich countries. When they give them the boat score and fish in developing country, West Africa, European boats, Pacific Island, US boats, or Japanese boats, you see it happen. And that takes food out of people who really need food. And men and women, most women who fish don't. We have big industrial fishing boats. You go to you go to Zanzibar, they, are, they go out, they do their cleaning, and that's what feeds the money. You don't see the money, it goes to the guys again. Huh? You don't do you want that to happen? You use your tax money to enhance inequality between men and women. I don't need to do that. No. And then the fishers and I even have a joke. I tell them in one talk, people had a big lie. I say, I'll whisk up the fish when I'm sleeping. I'm a whisperer, fish whisperer. And so I asked the fish, what do you think when people do this? What do you think about people? And you know what the fish told me? People are dumb. <laughs> you know, we, we sacrifice ourselves for you to feed and you overdo it with your tax money. You have big brains and you're not using it well. That's me and the fish, okay? So, so that's that. I'll soon finish. Then we have papers that dig into it, like the one, uh, is this a paper we have? In science advances, and what the main thing is, if you take our subsidies from boats fishing in the high seas, 54% of the fishing grounds will not be profitable. 50% of all the effort going to the high seas, which is 200 nautical miles away, is because of the, our tax money. Take it out, and the fish will be free. And that's, I think, my final slide. We did a lot of effort. UBC is known for our fisheries work. We managed to get this paper into science. It's a letter to science, but we put together about 300 scientists to write this paper. So we did the core draft and we invited in one. 277 scientists. And the letter is only 300 words, science letter. <laughs> so when it came out, it was so powerful. The director general of the 
she had to organize for me to hand this thing off to her. That's mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. This is the guy who was leading the official subsidy, the minister, the ambassador from Colombia. Mm -hmm. And I told I told a joke with Ngozi, I said, you know, this publication is probably the most precious you'll get. It's one word per scientist <laughs> in the world from all <laughs> continents. <laughs> yeah, so that is that. And by the way, she's the first woman ever to enter the video. She was the first to get us an agreement after more than 20 years of Director General's trying. They couldn't do it. So that tells you about gender equality, how that can be powerful. Thank you so much for attention. We have a powerful demonstration of the irrelevance of economics. That's a nice thing. A very little discussion of the cultural aspects of this whole situation. Perhaps it is that the somewhere in the deep corners of our hearts. We want to have this situation. Why is it that so much efficient and negative subsidy is provided with so much enthusiasm? It seems to ignore the, the needs of the workers, those who do the fishing, those who look after the caribou. There must need to be a direct cultural component. Mm -hmm. In this analysis, both is more for this. Culture is obviously important, right? I mean, yeah, I think because uh, maybe my colleagues will talk about it because it's our subsidies, and we have five to seven minutes, we have to condense things. and and do this, but surely, and like I said, when you look at the model, we need all these elements to really understand and move forward. And I have some good news for you. Next April, we have a book coming out, UBC first, by our group called Ocean Canada Partnership. And actually the first two main chapters in the book of 15 chapters is all about reconciliation, indigenous culture, and how that, really informs Canadian or should inform Canadian fisheries policy. So yeah, yeah. Well, that is forthcoming. Yeah. Um I, I guess I'm curious to know what you mean by so not to get what you mean by cultural. Like um that's it's just the term that I'm just not I guess I would want to hear more from you like what what you're looking for. On that, I guess the one thing I'll say, which I think came out in Rashid's, uh, your, your research on that great paper, um, that the spatializing subsidies one, and that the small, it was a small point of it, but I think it's crucial around the gendered side of it. So I don't know if this is, if this is a side of it, but I would say like in, in the Canadian context as well, um, like in terms of oil and gas subsidies or say mining subsidies, those are highly gendered workforces, namely like for example, mining in Canada has been at about 80% male domination mm -hmm. in, in the workforce for like ever, it has not changed at all. And so there is a gendered side to it in the way in sort of like thinking about what the state does and doesn't support in terms of like um, extracting sectors that there is like absolutely like a gendered component to it. So I'm not sure if that's where you were going. But that's one one comment I suppose I could make about a kind of cultural analysis. In terms of paper. You want to right away? Yeah. Well, yes, the gender gap is a lot of culture, of course. Um, what I mean by culture is the mindset mm -hmm. that we have, and which 
seems to feed into the uh, illogicalities of what you've just demonstrated in all these questions. So that yeah, culture is a very woolly word, but to me it's a very important word. I was in my reading of the situation after this nine months of the immersion in the in the problem. Yeah. And we have fortunate unfortunately we haven't had your input until this moment. So I can't be blamed for not putting the results that you provided for us in my argument. But the fact is that The best word I can think of is that we need to repent mm -hmm. from the mindset that we have because we're so much at odds as the humans in relation to the nature. nature. Yeah. And that's to me the essence of our little uh, catalyst program. Mm -hmm. But what is called the climate nature emergency has very little to do with the climate per se. Mm -hmm. Climate is part of it, but not central. And it seems to be increasing. We've heard from a series of specialized scholars in this uh, field. We've heard from some interesting scholars now. Mm -hmm. But not one of them, as far as I can recall, and I apologize because my memory is not what it used to be. That they have ended up. Ignoring the the mindset mm -hmm. in which we're all in which we're all stuck. Yeah. You want to say? Yeah, go ahead. After you. Right? I think, um, in terms of mindset, um, I'm thinking about the um, small scale fishing communities because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, it's a bit contradictory um, if you think about subsidies. It helps them because. Um, Fuel subsidies, one of the most pervasive public subsidies, actually help fishers to be able to cover their costs, their inefficient costs. So in terms of their mindset, they want that. But I think they don't, um, maybe it's the, their socioeconomic background or their lack of awareness that they don't connect what they're doing. I mean, the, the provision of this fuel subsidy to the impact on the fish stocks. So uh, if you want to change people's mindset in that regard, then I think it's more like on the ground of education, but um, but I think there's no excuse for the large scale fishing fleets where they obviously know what's happening in, to a large industrial fishing company. Yeah, I guess it's a half it's a half finished thought, but I think the question of who benefits, similar to in subsidies where they're captured both at the small scale and the large scale, is also a cultural question. Like who benefits from these subsidies can be understood structurally in terms of the graphs that we've seen and, and who's capturing the majority of the value and who's bearing the cost. But that's also a, a cultural question of um, who's the most vulnerable and how we let that continue and who's the most insulated from the risks and protected by laws and other kind of more cultural institutions. Let me, let me add a little bit. You you make me um, think about last week. Last week, uh, Daniel Pauli and myself were in LA to for the for the celebration of the Tyler Prize 2023, which the two of us managed to win. I, I don't know how, but okay. So we were there for the ceremony, and the team of my talk, my laureate talk, was actually. I said, we have to abandon the notion that we people can take anything, everything, everywhere, all at once. We have to abandon that because that is really the mentality of the capitalist system we have. Everything is for taking, everything, is, and we want to take it. You know, and that change of mind, I think we, we need it. And uh, it drives economics like crazy. So that was the structure. And I talked about what I mean by not everything all at once. So then you can talk about intergenerational equity, right? So we are taking all the salmon and the tuna and, and leaving the, the future generation with jellyfish or even mud, according to that. Level. So we need to change that mindset. And this idea, we have to take everywhere. We have to go in. 
there is a big debate now on deep sea mining. They want to go down there and knock off all these delicate uh, habitats just to grab with the dreams of a lot of money, which I don't think is there, actually. They're going to end up there with your tax money, find very little or nothing, and walk away and leave us with the dump. So that has to change. And then the, the other one is fishing everywhere. You know, there are some places which is better than them alone, right? Like we have advocated that the high seas, that's the middle of the ocean, if you like, away from coast, should all be, 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 be banned. No fishing. Those animals are very delicate. And the fish they go in to catch are the tunas that go in and out. We can catch them when they are in our waters, cheaply, less carbon. And then only a few countries at the moment take most of the benefits. The Chinas of the world, the Spain, the Korea. Guinea Bissau can't get that fish, even though it's supposed to benefit from but when they come into their waters, they can touch them. So we don't need to, you know, so maybe that's a kind of mind shift that uh, spoiling for in that way. Yeah. I'm gonna just say one more thing about the cultural thing. Yeah. I think I think the problem with the culture, like that the word, not not to just to push a little bit on it, I think is like that it makes it's just like a cultural problem. Mm -hmm. And I think part of what I think the analysis or the analytical approach that's been on display here is that we we also need to like demonstrate that not everyone benefits the same, mm -hmm. right? And so like, I, 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 I'm with you and I hear you around a world view or kind of like cultural analysis that says like, we've got like a take, take, take all, but I think there's, there's I'm not, I'm not sure and I think there's like educational and like other approaches to like try to get at some of those problems. But I also think like we need to be thinking in terms of like power and like where does that mindset come from? Who benefits from that mindset more than others? It's not even, right? And so I think there's there's just like a, a cultural analysis that's so general like that, I think, or a worldview analysis, like placing the problem within a worldview is just for me, just to it's just too diffuse, it's too like general and it doesn't like lend itself well to like a, a, like a, a political strategy basically that can like get at those distributional questions, so. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yeah, it's time to be more. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Paul Harrison, uh, Meredith College of the Public Department. And um, I, I, I was going to ask, use the term political, but kind of something I'm sort of looking for some guidance on. And then for another half of the thought, but the, the, current, the current drought of the decline of diversity and vast number of laws, policies, et cetera, struck me that for most people who uh, think of Canada, who don't live in areas where it's clear. Like, like in the northwest of DC, where all the gas holes are, and the caribou aren't for most of the um, people living here in the lower mainland have less direct yeah. um, sensory mm -hmm. learning about what, what is wrong. Are, are governments complicit because? They can tell us about all the wonderful policies and laws that have passed to protect this and that or the, uh, the sound or whatever. But the amount of money that we as a people, through our governments, devote to ensuring those policies are carried out, the, the checks on development are, are going on is pitiful. Mm -hmm. How do we take your learning and translate it into the Political action. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? You know what? One of the this is actually why uh, Paul, I I don't believe in publishing in a journal. Happy, go to sleep. My paper is published. No, <laughs> no, this, this doesn't work no more. You got to take that thing and actually go out and, and, and 
share the knowledge with people who can actually take action. And I think we're all doing a lot of that. This morning I had a, a nice interview with a journalist and I was telling her the same thing. I said, you, you call me, you wake me anytime in the night, I'm ready to talk to you about our research. So you can help us get it to the people. I think ultimately in democracies, right? Until the people know when something is gonna happen. So communication, uh, publicity stuff. Yeah, so one little way. I, th- I talk a lot with uh, high school kids at, at, in town here. I said, you have more power than you think. Just take your pen and write it, you shake it and write it to your member of parliament. You don't know how powerful that is. So anything we can do to really get engagement. Uh, Okay. Um, the study that Audrey and Adriana did got a ton, actually got a ton of media pick up at, at a really crucial time. We were we were smart. The study was <laughs> done. I, I work a lot with different groups around the province too. So there was a royalty review happening as well. And so there was a lot of interest in the study. It got picked up quite a lot. It's local and you know, not like you see why. So I think there is a kind of like, how do we make sure the work we do doesn't just stay in journals? Do you think that's part of it? But I also think when it comes to, I think that there's like a, there's a, when you think about these subsidies, and like why, what keeps these subsidies in place, right? And there's a part of it that's like, that the governments are just, choosing that so it's whoever you elected so there's like political side there like who do we elect in and what do they do and um and how aware are people about these subsidies so there's a sort of citizen knowledge side to, to changing them but i also think we have to like telescope out and think beyond the, the nation and that we are we exist in like a like a largely political economic system where states are like jockeying with each other for investment and for capital investment because jobs and investment are what sort of bolster them and give them legitimacy and get them reelected. And so there's also an international dimension, I think, to the advocacy work, which is I think why work around the WTO in this case is is so important. But thinking about how like just how the economic system is itself so structured in a direction that um, that can't be dealt with even domestically very well, right? right? Like if BC started to say, just for example, this critical minerals boom that's going on right now, the transition minerals, you've got like Australia just pouring money into subsidies. We want the critical mineral investment in our jurisdiction. You've got Canada Sorry. pouring the money into like, we want this there. And, that this is not straightforward. Like mining is an impact on biodiversity. And so there's there's going to be like really serious trade-offs here. Um, and so like I think like it's it's a it's complicated and I don't think there's a simple answer that doesn't take into account a kind of broader, more global or internationalist effort to kind of like have a different economic system. <laughs> it sounds so like, but I actually think it's 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 the case. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just add one thing. I haven't I haven't lived in British Columbia long enough to really speak to the dynamic that you're that you're pointing out, but I've heard others say it as well in terms of just this being a far away sacrifice zone that it seems mm-hmm. like not many people are that aware of. And in reading a lot of the um Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers materials for this research. A lot of the additional part of the investability in BC is saying that if you're going to extract oil and gas, then British Columbia has the best environmental standards. And so we should, if we're going to do it anywhere, it should be done here. And I just think that's an interesting, maybe to the kind of cultural question also, but to this idea that it's this faraway place, you can read that if you're in Vancouver, but then talking to people that we work with who live up there, their stories are like, we can't go to the river because there's a toxic yeah. gas leak. We can't, we've seen the caribou drinking toxic water. Like, um, so there's a bit of a disconnect maybe between, or maybe a reason to be extra critical or engaged around 
the narrative of like British Columbia having this really high environmental standard when there's still this ongoing sacrifice zone for a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. Well, then we get your message. Don't buy it. Don't <laughs> buy it. They're overselling. Yeah. And I was a witness to that way. There was a Canada in Asia conference, the first one that was organized by Canadian universities and Asian institutions. It was really a good one. You visit some people there. And this was exactly, I was on a panel. Mm -hmm. And that panel were five people or six, and three of, the, of them were from Alberta. Mm -hmm. And this was the, the story. Mm -hmm. Come to us if you want. We, we are the best in managing the environment and oil. We have a lot to sell to you. <laughs> So that, that mantra, and uh, I was there trying to push back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, gosh. We, we did a study of, just to say, on the environmental law side of things, or this this idea that Canada is a leader on this. So we did a study of, because um, we have environmental impact assessment, right, in Canada that, you know, for large developments you have to go through. So we looked at environmental projects that had a stated impact to caribou. In Canada, so we reviewed all of the documents. All there's 65 projects, mm -hmm. different kinds, pipelines, you know, large, large, uh, like tar sands developments, things like this. So they all had stated in them that there was going to be some impact to caribou, and so we looked closely at them to see, like, how did they consider caribou? What did that look like? All of them except one were approved, um, despite in some cases some of them wiping out like an entire uh, one of the population of caribou. Um, all except one, the one that was not approved was um, not because of caribou, it was some water issues. Um, so this is, again, it raises this question of what these laws are, are for and who they're for and whether they also are part of the problem, not the solution, right? And I think that's a really jarring situation to be in where you, where you, you, you look at something like environmental impact assessment, you ask, how is it considering endangered species? And you find that it's not. And so then you say, these are actually, are these laws actually kind of like greenwashing for the state, state-led greenwashing? Mm -hmm. I, this is like, I'm not sure that that's not going too far with mm -hmm. some, with some, um, because this, these are listed endangered species. We did another study, of, so just on the fisheries side, because there's people will say, oh, well, you need to look at federal jurisdiction for species at risk catch. So we looked at the 14 listed uh, endangered um, marine mammals um, and turtles to say, how are these considered by environmental impact assessment law? Um, and you'll find, you, so you look closely at the assessments and say, how are they considered highly endangered species? And we found that they're, they're not, right? So, it does, I think it raises questions about what these laws are for and who they're for, what kind of legitimacy they create, mm -hmm. despite being ineffective. Mm -hmm. I think that work that you mentioned is so important and it just, um, I think it just underlines that transparency is really critical to have like, in terms of how you do your environmental impact assessments and getting like a real, real situation out to the public. And what you just mentioned is just, I'm really surprised. Yeah, it's really boring research too. <laughs> we actually did that research today with, there are 15 undergrad students. So we scoured the impact assessment documents. It was a class that I ran. Um, it was, it was quite, so because there were a lot of documents and you, you can't, can't auto, automate it. So like there's no scripts you can write for it. So, so. yeah. Before we leave this topic, I want to say something for Canada, right? The idea that BC is probably better with these issues than another country could well be true, could well be true. But that doesn't mean that we are actually having an impact mm -hmm. on the environment. So it can be a little bit better than country X, but all of you are below. Yeah. The <laughs> and that is more likely the case, yeah. So, Maybe this already exists, but I'm wondering if one solution is to start a new news channel mm -hmm. where they tell the truth and the whole story. 
So they would also present, you know, the opinions of the mining and those kind of companies. But they would also bring up and highlight what you're talking about, which hardly anybody knows. So that if you get a public outcry, would that not help? Even like TikTok or <laughs> TikTok. <Yeah. laughs> The thing is, you know, you, you make me remember we did a, we put together the first uh, prize database for fish all over the world. So I was so proud of this. I, I was in the conference in Washington and I said, hey, we have it, we have it now. The whole, everybody should be happy because we have the data you go see. And there's Andy Rosenberg sitting in the uh, American colleague who was smiling whilst I was saying, after that, he said, who oh, she? You really, you really think everybody wants you to show the price of the fish? You can get what it's alluding to. When you talk about a channel that says the truth and the whole truth, I mean, what channel is that giving the political situation, the ideology? And, oh my gosh, you know, uh, you know, people who watch Fox is telling the truth, right? Uh, so you have that. All right. It's getting more complicated and scary, actually, when you look at it. Everybody have their mouthpiece that they go to and so fragmented. I want to be hopeful, but <laughs> um, let's be hopeful, okay? <laughs> the world is moving forward <laughs> somehow. <laughs> Available to, what we have available to us is the commodity of opium. Mm -hmm. It's just the maximization of opium. Yeah. 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 That's way forward. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? No more. Anyone have any more? So you want to get rid of some of these? Yeah. Comfort some of these. Not all. Yeah, but there you go. Right? What is that? Actually, we want to divert them. Mm -hmm. I will be happy if they give them the money to go on holidays. No problem. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. don't kill the fish that they spend on. So That's the, like surfing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hanging out in the park. <laughs> you know. Picnics on the beach. Or, or also the Germans have a policy. They will pay fishers to go fish for plastic rather than fish. <laughs> Clean up the ocean, right? Get your money. We want. We don't want anyone to stop. So they get their income. They clean up the ocean. The fish get a break. We get more fish in the future. I think it's this kind of thinking we need. Does that does that help a bit? I'm looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> you look I like your skeptical. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you want to say more? Please. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering about solutions for anything. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. All I hear is problems. So. Yeah. Well, I can jump in. I mean, one thing at the very least that British Columbia could, the government of British Columbia could do is say, we won't subsidize drilling for wells in critical <laughs> care of habitat. Like, a, to give a very kind of, the bar is quite low yeah. example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You could take those funds and support gra graduating university students to to kind of do climate related uh, restoration or ecological restoration. And there's kind of akin to there's been ideas being floated around about creation of a climate core mm -hmm. um, by a lot of different NGOs, but also groups saying like what we need to do is take like state funds and like employ students to really uh, graduate to 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 be out doing restoration on um, in northern bc right you could use it to for nations to do that restoration you know we work a lot with the west moberly first nation a treaty eight nation and i mean yeah what would it look like to to use those funds to support you know really good ecological forestry and and um, so I think there's no shortage of ideas about what needs funding. Um, healthcare, I mean, healthcare for healthcare for climate, right? I mean, these are not these are like care work. Yeah. It's like such it's such a needed investment area. 
So taking it from extraction to care, like, you know, extractive industries to care work. And that's a really, yeah. yeah. So redirecting the funds. Yeah. I was in, I was in a small town in Mexico. So yeah, I, don't, I won't try to mention. And what they do is during long vacation, when students come for summer from universities and colleges, the fisheries department employs them right, to help them collect data, analyze data, mm -hmm. even, even watch if somebody is poisoning. You know, they use poison to fish and dynamite, record them. So in that way, they give the students income, which helps the families, mm -hmm. and they help the environment. So we just need to do things that reinforce positive feedback between nature and people and people and nature. Instead of at the moment, what do we do? We just reinforce negative feedback. Take fuel subsidies, go take down the fish and you know, put security problems, jobs and so on. You know, let me try and see what I can call this. <laughs> you know, in 2016, I had this privilege. I, I gave a talk at the State Department with President Obama in the room, right? So I, I had to have it, make a joke right now. And <laughs> this is funny. So that did, that, that's still my highlight in my view, right? So John Kerry was the first to talk. He gave his ocean talk. He cares about the ocean. He's from the Boston area and so on. Then he introduced President Obama, who gave a talk. The next one was Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> <laughs> and he donated 10 million to conservation. <laughs> and I tell you, my dear people, your little Rashid was the number four. To talk to you. <laughs> Come on, there. And so I, 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 one of the points I made is why we should protect fish, fish stocks. There are many reasons. Carbon, we haven't even talked about many ecosystem services here. So I said, you remember when Obama came? Within two years, he started graying up. It was in the news. It was getting gray. <laughs> and then I say, you know, the oceans of the world support income for about 260 million people around the world, most of them in developing, large developing countries. And I said, if not for those jobs, Obama would have been grayer. Because the thing was, the, the problems would stop in the Philippines or in Nigeria, they would get to the table of leaders like Obama, right, on the struggle. And he would have been great. And I said, not only him, all of us in the room would have been great. <laughs> After that, one, one, one participant <laughs> came and told him, he never get great. <laughs> so so the, the, there's so many connections here. So hopefully, yeah. Oh, gosh. You make me laugh. Oh yeah, he's he was sitting like that, smiling. It's crazy guy, <laughs> but people loved it. Well, I can't believe it that there are no more questions, so I just have to stand up and uh, thank you for thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, wow. By the way, comment about culture. Yeah, uh, I would say that you've demonstrated all four of you. The value of the transdisciplinary work that you're doing, and which is what we hope to continue to work with. We are uh, grateful for your presence. We have four people touched distinction in one session, our little cohort group, and it's honored to make to have you. Thank you so much. And we hope that you will accept a small gift. Oh, this is the gift. <laughs> wow. Coincidentally, at our next session in a week's time, uh, there will be a presentation on the fate of reindeer and caribou. Oh. In the northern hemisphere, oh, so and uh, the coincidence is quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it would be helpful to have another perspective. Yeah. Thank you all for attending. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.